Well, it's the uh, 21st of July, 2020, and the big news is that uh, almost 23% uh, of Delhi's population has uh, turned out to be seropositive. This means that 23% of the people living in Delhi have antibodies to COVID-19 of the IgG variety. Apparently, 21,000 samples were taken, so that's a very large pool. The volume sample is uh, quite adequate. And the results varied in different parts of Delhi, with higher prevalence of antibodies seen in Northern Delhi, Shahadra and Northeast Delhi, where it went up to almost 28% or 27%, but the average is 23%. Now, this is excellent news because a large chunk of Delhi's population now has become immune to COVID-19 and we are rapidly heading to the herd immunity threshold or maybe we've already crossed it. But as usual, the mainstream media has goofed up. The Hindustan Times carries a headline that, alas, oh my God, 77% of people are not positive for the antibodies, which of course is, is great irony. The editor or the editors have no clue as to what is the immunology seen in COVID-19. When we have 23% of the population having antibodies to COVID-19, this means that almost 46 or 50% of these people, of the population of Delhi, are also having the other cells called the T cells. Now remember, even though, of course this is not proven, there is a suggestion that the antibodies produced against COVID-19 may come down in quantum over a span of three to four months, the T cells will continue to work. These are also called memory T cells, which means that if in future an individual gets infected with COVID-19, the T-cells ramp up the protection mechanism against a future infection of COVID-19, despite the fact that the antibodies themselves have gone down. So this is excellent news because this probably is the reason why the counts in Delhi are going down the mortality is going down and also the new cases are steadily in the decline. The other fact is that I think the health ministry has uh, stated today that the uh, crude case fatality rate is below 2.5%. Now let's uh, calculate the uh, infection mortality rate in Delhi as of now. The fact that 23% of the population or 24% of the population is, has been infected by COVID-19 means that as Delhi has a population of approximately 200 lakhs, which is uh, 20 million, 24-25% of uh, 200 lakhs means 50 lakh people have been infected. Now straight away what I've been saying for so many months is true that what the PCR test has provided us the figure by the PCR test today is 1,25,000. So in actuality, that is almost 1 50th of the real figure. So the ratio is not 1 is to 10, but almost as high as 1 is to 50. Because we know by the serological testing that 23, 24, 25% of Delhi's population has become infected by COVID-19. Now, because the number of deaths which have occurred in Delhi so far are about 3,700, that means the case fatality rate is again much below 2.5%, but the infection fatality rate goes down to 0.07%. So if you are fans of the uh, James Bond uh, flicks, the number is very simple to remember. It is 0.07% is the infection fatality rate in Delhi right now. And I'm sure this will go down further. 
Now the skeptics might say that, look, 3,600 or 3,700 deaths seem to be an underestimation. So I will agree with them to a large extent and presume that the deaths are actually double this figure, which means more than 7,000 people have died, more than 7,200 people have died actually because of COVID-19. Remember, this is a presumption. Even then, the infection fatality rate comes to barely 0.14%, which is almost as good or as bad as the seasonal flu fatality rate. Now comes the big question as to why are we having these lockdowns? Why do we have these lockdowns over weekends? Why do we have these strict lockdowns in different parts of the country? There actually is no scientific basis because the infection fatality rate is extremely low and therefore we must have now not a general lockdown. If required, we must have something like a surgical strike, which means that selected populations are protected. They are kept in a semi-formal or informal quarantine. The rest of the people are allowed to mingle. The rest of the people are permitted to go back to their work because that, again, I've been repeating again and again and again, getting back to work, getting back to some sort of normalcy is, is, is essential now before we completely demolish our economy. Now, the other point is that in case, in case I, who has been working in a hospital almost on a daily basis throughout this uh, pandemic, have antibodies, then do I need a vaccine? Now that is a big question for me. I personally may not be very enthusiastic for a vaccine regardless of its efficacy if I already carry antibodies to the Chinese virus or the COVID-19 virus. Now I will repeat that and I can extrapolate from there. If 23 to 50 percent of Delhi's population already has been infected, then the vaccine may not be a big deal, right? But of course, there's a lot of buzz about the vaccines. Nowadays, we have reports of a new vaccine data, that is the uh, vaccine from Oxford, which has uh, Oxford University, which has uh, partnered with AstraZeneca. They are coming with a vector-driven vaccine. In this, I've explained this earlier, they, they use a, a harmless uh, chimpanzee common cold virus. They embed a gene into this virus, inject the vaccine into an individual. That gene then, the virus with the gene penetrates the cell of the concerned human and then gives directions to produce the spike portion only of the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus. And then the body manufactures antibodies against the spike portion. And these antibodies then protect the individual in future from a future infection by COVID-19. Now we have phase one and phase two data published two days back. No, in fact, it was published yesterday in The Lancet. And this includes 1,066 or 70 healthy participants, their ages ranged from uh, 18 to 55 years. They were all confirmed to have not had COVID-19 in the past and had been asymptomatic. The, the news is, or rather the data which has been published, shows that there was a robust development of antibodies to the vaccine. The antibody titer increased four times the normal, which means the vaccine is effective. This neutralizing antibody titer was seen in almost 95% of the participants. After the first injection, there were 10 people who were given two injections. In them, all of them developed the necessary quantum of antibodies after the second injection. 
So therefore, the protocol may be that people would need two injections of this uh, Oxford vaccine. This was, a, this was a randomized study in which half of the participants were given the vaccine, the other half were given the meningococcal vaccine. The important thing mentioned by the researchers is that the side effects or the adverse effects were very few or, and also pretty mild, which could be tackled by a tablet of paracetamol. So we could use prophylactic crocin, prophylactic paracetamol to, to prevent or to diminish the symptoms of being feverish, headaches, body aches, generalized uh, weakness. So the vaccine has been found to be reasonably safe and it has been found to produce the adequate, adequate uh, number or quantum or, qual or quantity of antibodies. The other exciting news is that the researchers also found that all the participants who were given the vaccine develop T-cells after a fortnight. 100% development of T-cells after a fortnight, which means that this vaccine not only develops antibodies of the IgG kind, but also T-cells. Now remember, T-cells are equally effective, if not more effective, in preventing future infections, and the T-cells may last for decades. It has been found that T-cells against SARS the original SARS, which appeared in 2002, are still present. So therefore, T cells can last for at least 17 years. That is very important. Uh, that is a very important fact to keep in mind. Because I, I keep reading these reports in various uh, newspapers and uh, other media that uh, the antibodies being produced why this infection may be inadequate or may not last long enough. Now that I think is very, very, very untrue. The fact is that antibodies are produced as antibodies are produced by other diseases such as tetanus or mumps and measles. In the case of measles and mumps, antibodies are produced for, for a lifetime. Protection is given for a lifetime. In the case of tetanus, protection is given for at least 10 years by vaccination. It is also known that natural infections are more powerful manufacturers of antibodies and immunity than vaccines. So to come back to the original point, Delhi has a zero prevalence of 23 to 24%, which means that Delhi is seeing herd immunity very fast, or already has herd immunity, and therefore maybe a case can be made that vaccines are not mandatory, at least for Delhi, but we have to wait for that. And speaking on the vaccine, these are preliminary results. These are initial results. All that we know is that the vaccine is, is, is quite safe. It does produce antibodies, but we still don't know whether these antibodies that are produced, whether they can actually fend off a real infection. So for that, we need to wait for the phase three trials, which I think are supposed to begin in August very soon. And that would include thousands, probably almost I think I understand 11,000 people in the United Kingdom and 37,000 people in Brazil, America and South Africa and I think quite a few, quite a few thousands in, in India also. And of course we have the Indian vaccine also which is being uh, developed, which is being studied. I think phase one trials are going on, phase two trials and these results should be published. The only difference is that the Indian vaccine is an inactivated vaccine, which means the virus is dead. There is no DNA mRNA technology in the Indian vaccine, which will be made by, I think, uh, the company is called Bharat Biotech in collaboration with the ICMR. So that is about the vaccine. There's another very good news, which uh, the mainstream media in India has not uh, focused upon. And that's, you know, that's the usual stuff. You see, a paper was published in May, early May this year on the use or the efficacy of interferon injections in patients of mild to moderate COVID-19 patients. What was seen, and this was a randomized study, it was an open label randomized study, but it was a randomized, randomized study. The, the number of patients were few, only 120 odd, about 85 were administered interferon 
about 41 were given uh, the work served as a control group let me give you the details the control group was given uh, two drugs they, were, they are called lopinavir and ritonavir the the treated group was uh, given lopinavir ritonavir plus ribavirin plus interferon injections so the backbone of the treated group was interferon what was found was that the duration of symptoms was was significantly reduced from eight days to only four days in the group which was given injectable interferon on alternate days only two or three injections were required and more importantly the virus was not detected in the interferon group as soon as seven days after seven days in the interferon group you could not pick up the virus by PCR test whereas in the control group the, vac the virus was detectable till about 12 to 13 or 14 days so the authors concluded that this was a phase 2 trial and they would welcome a phase 3 trial including many more thousands of patients so that the role of interferon could be established what is interferon? interferon is also present naturally in the human body it is also a part of the immune mechanism and when you inject interferon then you are boosting the, the uh, immunity the anti-inflammatory system in the body against the, the Wuhan virus so that is the, the science behind the injections of interferon I am talking about interferon because today there is uh, there are reports of a study done by Southampton University this is a pilot study which had only 100 patients of, uh, of COVID-19 they were divided into two groups one group received interferon by inhalation and the results were very nice there was almost a fall of 80% there was a reduction of 80% in the treated group given inhaled interferon and this 80% reduction was seen in the requirement for, uh, for uh, ventilators and even death the placebo group had three people dying whereas the treated group there was no person who died so again there is great promise of inhaled interferon and uh, there is there is need and it is being done they are now planning bigger trials including more patients with inhaled interferon so the two good uh, bits of uh, information that I can impart this evening are one that Delhi has 23% seropositive, seropositivity 23% have antibodies against COVID-19 which is a large number of patients large number of people who have been infected and this means that we have either already crushed herd immunity or we are rapidly encroaching herd immunity the second thing is that the Oxford vaccine data has been published in the Lancet the data is promising but it is preliminary it has to be confirmed in a phase 3 trial which will begin very soon and the third thing is that we have uh, inhaled interferon which has been found to be very promising in efficacy in a pilot trial okay with that I will stop tonight thank you very much